Another thing that we'll, we'll run through quickly. No one had ever thought of, before the arts and crafts era, and this is, this is a piece of Robertson Dedham, the same gentleman who brought you the copper red. Before this time period, it never would have occurred to anybody aesthetically to use a volcanic three-dimensional crater glaze of this type for aesthetic purposes. Glazes, these things, these things occur in a, in, a, in a glaze because a gas is being liberated in the, in the process of the firing and it preserves the artifact of something having burnt out. Glazes can be made to do this by firing them too hot. They can be made to do it by firing them too low. But usually it's the result of, in previous times, usually it's the result of, of just a misfiring or horrible defect. Somebody would have gotten something out of a less adapted version of this out of a kiln 200 years previous would have thrown it in the corner because it would have been just a, a, a wasted pot. Robertson's particular genius was to see that this is something beautiful, it's primal, it's special, it's avant-garde. This is something made in the 1880s. Think about that. This, it's, coming, it's coming almost from an entirely different century. I mean, I can't imagine what the furniture equivalent of this would have been at the time period if they'd been allowed to go off on this kind of tangent. Hugh Cornwall Robertson, H-U-G-H. Now, to, show you, to sh sh show you just variations on somebody who knows how to play a kiln like a violin, this is a piece that I'm blessed to have in my personal collection, but of a certainty, this piece and the one preceding it were fired at the same time in the same kiln with the same batch of glaze. This one was fired in a place in the kiln higher up or something where it was a little hotter. It's no different than if you're baking a cake or you have a, you're, baking thanks, you're making Thanksgiving dinner. Every cook knows there's a place in the oven where you put the rolls, there's a place where the turkey goes, you know. Every oven, anything that derives heat is going to be hotter in one place than another, and Robertson would have known this too. This is just the same glaze, a little more melted. Piece of Tiffany. The, the glassmaker seemed, I don't know that much about glassmaking, so please indulge me, but uh, my, t t it seems to be an easier effect and more commonly used in glass than it ever was utilized in pottery, but this Tiffany piece is, is a masterpiece, but it's probably 10, 15 years after Robertson's, so the glass people usually get the most credit and bring the most money, but uh, Robertson's the, the, guy, the guy that brings this into being. All, all, all tribute to Lewis Comfort. Again, George Orr, same thing. George Orr didn't work with high temperature glazes. He's working with the tradition that he learned in the folk pottery of the hills, and they're all, all of, all of George Orr's glazes, glazes are lead based, without exception, I would believe. And this piece is another one that was probably purposely, at least the parts on it that have that sort of bubbling effect, they're purposely overfired, and in another pottery, they would have been seen as a terrible defect. Here they're used to make a thing of beauty. Uh, crystal, crystal and glaze is another innovation of the time. This is not an area in which I possess any enormous tech, uh, enormous expertise, but these these are these are uh, pieces by Adelaide Robineau. Crystal and pottery is not so uncommon now because the the most germane thing to achieving it is having a very steady temperature in a kiln. Any graduate sc student with a little bit of skill can make good crystal and glazes in an electric kiln. But the people firing at the turn of the century didn't have the electric kilns, and it's very difficult to hold a steady temperature. These have to hold a steady temperature at a high temperature for a long time to get these crystals to sort of grow. My sense is that the French were the first ones to achieve it, but at the time that these were made technically, aside from their beauty, they were very, very, very difficult to make and very precious and treasured, and for good reason. These are French Sevres pieces at the same time, also with these beautiful mounts, but you can see how beautifully this effect could be achieved. A piece of Fulper. This is in the same realm of, of uh, I call, th these are crystal and glazes for want of a better word. I have to mention these. These are, this is a Rookwood gold. This is, of course, a very famous piece of Rookwood, a Matt Daly piece. It was a cover of the Glorious Gamble. It's one of the great pieces of Rookwood ever made. This is an, a, a truly accurately called adventurine glaze. It's a goldstone glaze. Rookwood probably got these glazes happening sheerly by accident because their glazes and the colors underneath them have a lot of iron in them. All that you're basically, all that you're pretty much looking at here is lead, sand, a whole lot of iron, and a little bit of clay. This this pot, I, I always, I like saying this. These pots are worth nothing. What parts value to them is the genius of the artist that made them. The, the, there's no raw material in there that can be melted down and turned into a ring. It's it's just in, an ingenious way to do it. But interestingly, when these lead glazes, some of them, they get super saturated with iron, they'll, they'll crystallize out in this beautiful gold, and it's very difficult to control. Uh, I'll throw a plug to my friend Chris Powell, who's, who's generously here in the audience. He's probably the only contemporary potter amongst my peers that has brought this technique back into a level of perfection. He has a number of nice pieces at the show. Make a point of visiting him and seeing him because no one else knows how to do it anymore. 
another show you the, another this is a piece of believe it or not this is a piece of Tico same technique some and Tico did a lot of experimental stuff but it seems like it all all the experimental pieces have kind of been lost in the lost in the in the in the, in the, in the grand pursuit of Matt Green oh, electroplated this again this is not an area where I'm enormously I'm an enormously expert but uh, it's it's the first time it's the first time in history that this is being done, and it's a very unusual it's a very unusual thing to have been able to do. I see I, I see by the clock on the wall I'm I'm, I'm running I'm running near, near the near the end of the line, so I'm going to advance forward quite a bit and kind of bring this bring this all back home. We're 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 nearly at our, at the end. I wanted I wanted to sort of conclude with with, with pots with pots of this type because. To show you as much as much as the opposite opposite polarity is always playing at the same time. This is a, a very rare piece of pot. I mean, it's very simple. This is a very rare unglazed piece by a piece of Helm pottery, which is a New York pot, pottery from New York State. It's it has no glaze on it at all. But in the time period, the potters were experimenting across a broad spectrum, and somebody just thought, well, let's just get down to the most basic of things: make a really fine pot and that we can put a flower in, and it doesn't need a glaze at all. It's pretty in and of itself. You know, all things, all things lovely are not are not melted in a kiln. Markham pottery, a rare pottery from uh, rare pottery from Ann Arbor, Michigan, that ultimately moved out to California. Wonderful arts and crafts innovator. Made pots for the sole purpose of putting roses in for their horticultural business. Un this is basically unglazed pottery that breathes. He made them just for the purpose of making something pretty to put his roses in. If that's not art, arts and crafts, I don't know what it would be. But yet they're more than just flower pots. They're lovely. Piece of brush guild, another New York pottery, ancient, taking an ancient, ancient pottery, ancient Roman and Cyprian pottery as his cue, unglazed. And as all things conclude, we all end up back with the great George Orr, who, who is a genius we'll be catching up with the 200 years from now. Got bored with glazes, he was getting too much attention for it and being sort of uh, emotionally perverse. He decided, I'm done with that, I need to show people what I can really do. And he could make things of extraordinary beauty without having to get into glazes at all. So, starting from the most complicated to the, to the, to the, to the most, most pristine, this is probably what we're all evolving to. So I don't want to run into any more time from, from, my, from, from the folks, from the folks that, are, that, are, that, are to, that are to come after me. There's another wonderful lecture getting ready to happen. I hope you'll be able to stay around for it. I'm really grateful that you all came out to support me today, and I hope that you enjoyed this about half as much as I did. Thank you so much for coming.